Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to another live stream here at Monticello. Uh, my name is Laura Michael Balderson. I work in the education department, uh, and I am happy to be here today um, with uh, two colleagues. Um, Bob Self uh, did contract work for the foundation from 1983 to 1994, and then he came on staff to do architectural restoration in 94 uh, and worked here through 2014. Uh, and his position culminated as Director of Restoration from 2012 to 2014. And then we also have with us Charles Morrill, uh, who was a full-time guide here at the Foundation in 1985, uh, was here for about a year, and then launched his career as a craftsman at Gaston and Wyatt, uh, which is an architectural uh, millwork firm. Uh, and then about 10 years ago, uh, Charles rejoined us uh, and has been here both as a guide uh, and continuing with Gaston and Wyatt. Uh, and we're going to be talking today uh, about a very specific part of the house, um, but we're going to start uh, a little bit broader to begin with. So uh, my first question is for you, Bob. Can you tell us a little bit about restoration here at Monticello and why that's so important? Well, restoration really has been an ongoing process for well over 100 years now, beginning with the Levy family who acquired Monticello in 1835 and finally transferred it to the Thomas Jefferson Memorial Foundation in 1923. We know for certain that in the late 19th century, uh, the second generation of Levy ownership, Jefferson Monroe Levy, was undertaking restoration work due to the fact that the place had deteriorated considerably during the period of the Civil War when the house was taken over by the, uh, the Confederacy because the levees were, were New Yorkers. But yes, restoration is, is an incredibly important part of the foundation's mission here uh, to try and show Monticello as accurately as possible as it was during Jefferson's time. And it can really be a very complicated sort of process because Jefferson was always thinking about various solutions to architectural problems. And some of the things that he was thinking about uh, didn't necessarily make it into reality. So we have to be very careful to discern things that actually were implemented versus things that he was thinking about. I, I think that uh, I think that the dining room fan, that's a good one. He designed this dining room fan uh, in which uh, the, it was a clockwork mechanism and the pendulum was a huge fan element and it was driven by a giant clock escapement uh, and uh, probably driven by weights that descended through the stairwell, but it never happened, did it? Well, we looked for evidence for it because it would have meant penetrating the dining room wall to get into the second floor passageway that adjoined the dining room. And we tried as hard as we could to find some evidence for it, but never were able to, uh, to find anything that actually proved that uh, it was actually implemented. Darn. <laughs> yeah. Well, we've talked about doing a, a full oh, uh, mock-up of it we, just for fun, have, funsies, haven't just, we? <laughs> just for fun. <laughs> the ultimate dining room fan. Yeah, the, with the clock descending in the, or the weights descending in the stairwell. That was yeah. uh, quite yeah. a concept. Yeah, it was. Yeah. <laughs> So my next question, uh, Charles, is going to be for you. Um, so to begin with, can you tell us a little bit about what architectural millwork is? Sure. Architectural millwork has to do with um, all of the woodwork and uh, that uh, really holds a, a house together. All of the, the moldings, uh, uh, the sash, the window sash, uh, uh, the shutters, uh, the sills, all of these parts that sort of bring it all together. Columns often too, uh, uh, and capitals and all of those architectural elements. So, uh, you know, Gaston Wyatt has been doing uh, this sort of thing for a very, very long time. Uh, when, did we get, when did we get involved? Well, I guess it was during the dome room restoration, uh, the first project I was aware of uh, yeah. with Blaise Gaston making the, uh, the circular sashes as part of the dome room restoration. Yeah. And they're still there. I mean, it was a spectacular job. These wonderfully large uh, round windows that actually pivot open, almost like uh, portholes horizontally. And uh, they certainly stood the test of time. And over the years, Gaston and Wyatt has done quite a bit here. Uh, we worked on the roof restoration and all those almost like things that look like columns underneath the railing on the top of Monticello. And uh, oh gosh, uh, over the years, the, the front doors, uh, the back doors, and I, am, I remember working on those and also these uh, these sort of Venetian porches, I guess 
in, in addition to, uh, I'll see all the, all the railing and uh, oh, just so much, so much more. Then there was all the wonderful work, uh, these models of various things that were produced for, for the, uh, the visitor center, the new visitor center. Right, right. Uh, the, we have a, a you know, scale model of the framing of, uh, of uh, Jefferson's dome that one of my good friends, Wes Leach did. Uh, and Je Jeff, I remember Jefferson saying it couldn't be simpler. <laughs> and Wesh is pretty much an engineer, is you know thinking, couldn't be harder. <laughs> so it's funny. It was a complicated uh, construction for sure. There were yeah. I think uh, six different species of rafters because it was based on a stretched octagon. So all of the ribs were actually had a different run to them, even though they had the same rise and the arc had to be consistent throughout. It was amazingly complex. Yeah, it certainly was, but he got it right. But Jefferson understood it. He draws it out using trigonometry uh, yeah. and projection. Uh, so he was able to mathematically uh, draw it out as an architect, uh, this, this very complicated concept. Hmm. My favorite though. It's the automatic, the little miniature automatic door. Oh yeah, door, yeah, uh, West did those too. A wonderful model in the visitor center we have. Uh, Jefferson had the, the parlor doors are actually connected underneath the floorboards. So if you open one parlor door, the other one sort of follows along all on its own. And uh, we, we did that as, as well too for the visitor center. Yep. Yeah. So lots of different projects uh, that Gaston and Wyatt has been involved with here at the foundation. But today we're talking about a particular uh, project um, which I am really excited to be a part of this conversation uh, because we spend a lot of time talking about the house and about the architecture, but we usually are speaking in pretty broad terms. We're talking about uh, Palladian ideas and neoclassicism and symmetry and things like that. Um, and we often don't have time with our guests to get into uh, really the details of some of these really fascinating, complex, uh, 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 almost details, right, uh, uh, for the house, uh, the Jefferson design. So we're talking about the restoration of the uh, exterior blinds. And I'm going to start by asking, how did this restoration project begin? Well, it really began in the late 1990s with the restoration of these uh, Venetian porches, as Jefferson called them, which were louvered enclosures off the private suite of rooms that he had at, the, uh, at one end of the house. And he referred to this mechanism of laths operating on a double pivot or moving on a double pivot. So the question was, what exactly did he mean by a double pivot? So at the time of the restoration, we really didn't fully understand, as it as it turned out, what he meant by a double pivot. Yeah. And here we, we got a mock-up here. Yeah. We sort got of thought a, at that time. We got a mock-up here, and I'll, I'll hold it like this. And a lot of people might be familiar with, uh, you know, uh, shutters that work like this uh, today. Although Jeff Jefferson called his blinds as they were on the exterior. But uh, what you've got is a, a slat here and each slat has a pin at the end of it. And the pins go into the sides of, uh, sides of, the, uh, of the shutter right there. And then you have an operating rod right here so that you can uh, move the, the slats up and down like this and then adjust them for the light. So and, it's... Yeah, well, I, you know, I'm, I always thought for a long time, you know, double pivot, well, there you go. You've got a pivot here and a pivot there, but I remember you didn't like it, and you and Bill were really cherry about that. Well, it made sense at the time, um, and we were able to rationalize it because blinds like that do exist at the University of Virginia, even though this, this idea of, of uh, operable slat blinds really didn't come into popularity until later in the 19th century. So based on the fact that we had examples at UVA, we felt comfortable at that time with going with that as the... Uh, the basis for the restoration of these Venetian porches. But I, I remember it, you were uneasy about it. It didn't just sit well. Well, it's double pivot. I mean, it just uh, it just didn't make sense. And, you know, yeah. I was, you know, talking with various people about it. Uh, and I happened to mention it to a fellow by the name of Chris Orstrom, who was doing a lot of research, architectural research work down in Jamaica. And he said, ah, I know exactly what you're talking <laughs> about. And so this is in 2000. Uh, four, which was yeah. four years after the Venetian porch project was completed. And so he, he sends us this image of what really would qualify as a double pivot mechanism. And here we've got a little model. Yeah, we've got so it. We've got something to show that. you here. This is uh, now in this, 
each slat, instead of just having one pivot point, has two on each end. And then these two sort of pegs go into the operating mechanism, and it works like this. And, well, my goodness, <laughs> Thomas Jefferson would have loved this. You know, he loved these things that turned and pivoted and folded, and, you know, it, I think that's just, that's just perfect. But, boy. Another reason this makes sense, too, with this construction is that we know that these slats were very, very broad. So to have just a single pivot point is just sort of a weak sort of thing. Uh, not to mention the fact that the staples uh, used in the construction were vulnerable as well. But still, just because we see them in Jamaica doesn't mean anything in terms of what we might expect to see here in, in, uh, in Virginia at Monticello uh, when it had anything to do with Jefferson. But then a couple of years later, a blind turned up during the restoration of Montpelier, which is James Madison's home in Orange County, with the exact same construction detail going on. And at that point, white. I, th I really remember. I think you on. called me. Yeah. <laughs> so again, I mean, uh, made perfect sense that Dinsmore might have been copying something that he had been fully exposed to here. And of course, James Dinsmore was Jefferson's master builder, who was here for ten years from. Uh, uh, 18, uh, yeah, I'm going 1798 until yeah. 18, 189. No, yeah. eight, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, it would have been 18. This up. That's okay. Yeah. Comes in 1798. Yeah. And leaves in uh, 18, no, it would have been 18. 18, yeah. Yeah. Well, at any rate, um, forgive me. Uh, Jefferson's master builder making blinds for Montpelier, which is where he, he went when he left Monticello in 18, 1809. And so at that point, we started thinking, well, maybe we've got something here to use as a basis for restoration. But then something else turned up that was even more particular to the maker that Jefferson referred to as being the one who actually made the blinds, which was Peter Lennox. And Peter Lennox was a joiner in Washington, DC. And as it turned out, there were a number of his blinds that were still surviving in the, in the U.S. Capitol that were documented as being his work. So we went up there and examined those blinds, and the combination of the construction of those and Dinsmore's blinds were used as, as the basis for the construction of the blinds, uh, exterior blinds here at Monticello. So we have a couple of questions here. Um, Andy and Bonnie would like to know if these blinds are operative or just decorative. They are fully operative. Absolutely are. And then uh, a second question is, uh, what is the benefit of having these dual pivot, pivot blinds, blinds as opposed to, to uh, uh, the single, single pivot, pivot that you demonstrated pivot. earlier? Well, the single pivot, particularly on this, uh, this very broad slat, is, is rather a weak construction. And also, it depends on having uh, an operating bar that's attached to the face of the slats using staples, which was a very, very weak sort of situation. And actually, we use this uh, concept for the reconstruction of Venetian, the Venetian uh, porches and started almost immediately having trouble with the staples in particular. And ultimately, when we found the evidence for this, this true double pivot system, the system was restored on the blinds on the Venetian porches. So now it also has the same kind of mechanism. Great. Um, and then can you talk to us a little bit about the difference between blinds and shutters? Many people use those two terms interchangeably. Um, and even in the period, that was the case. But as Jefferson expressed it, blinds were really used for modulation of light and air circulation. And shutters were basically more for security. And Monticello has both blinds and shutters. There are interior shutters that are barred uh, at night that are used for security. And then the blinds were used during the daytime, particularly here on the West Front. You can imagine during the summertime, uh, the amount of sun to shade things inside the house and keep things cooler. Um, interesting to me that today we usually expect to see blinds inside and shutters outside and it's funny that that is reversed at the time um, but 
some of these windows are, are off the ground and it would be challenging to, for security purposes, close those shutters every night, right? If, if they were um, uh, up high and outside like that. Um, so you have talked a lot about uh, sort of the process of figuring out uh, what um, sort of physically Jefferson had intended here, um, but can you talk about um, the process a little bit more um, in terms of um, finding all of the details. We've talked a lot on different live streams about how it's it's often like a detective's job, right? Uh, uh, to find all of these different clues to figure out what Jefferson actually wanted. Well, it really was a combination of these three different species of blinds that we discovered over the years. The ones in Jamaica, the one that James Dinsmore made for Montpelier, and then finally the ones that Peter Lennox made for the US Capitol. It might be useful too to demonstrate one of the blinds that's actually in place here on the house. Sure. One thing that we learned uh, in Washington uh, was that they had these little cams that were mounted on the side of the, uh, the frame there that both keep the blinds closed and will also serve to keep them at different uh, levels uh, when they're open. So if you see, you rotate that cam so that the squared part is parallel with the, the movement of the shutter, then that allows you to operate the blind. And you can also keep it at a given position too by rotating it so that the tip of it sort of binds against the operating portion of it. Like so. So you have some wonderful models uh, that you've demonstrated for us here today. Can you talk to us about the prototyping process and how you um, sort of took this from these different examples that you'd seen from Jefferson's writings uh, and made it into these beautiful functional blinds? Yeah, well, that was, uh, that was not easy. I think the first thing to talk about would be just the wood. Uh, the wood here, uh, this is Southern longleaf pine and it is incredibly tough stuff. And uh, it's pretty difficult to machine because uh, you'll be going along and then all of a sudden one part will vanish and we have to throw this away and make another one. Uh, but at Gaston and Wyatt, first of all, we had to take this design and really look at it and decide how are we gonna do this? Because we're a modern architectural millwork firm and what we need to do is to sort of, sort of marry the sensibilities and the craftsmanship of, you know, old world, colonial type, you know, mill, mill work with modern production techniques. Because uh, after all, uh, if we had, I mean, we could, we have the capability, it would take us a long time to, to do all of these traditionally, but it would take a few years. <laughs> and, and, you know, we just simply don't have the time. So what we're going to do is we're going to marry, uh, you know, this computer technology. We have a large computer controlled router and we're going to use that uh, to cut out uh, uh, these operating rods like this. And uh, this was this was really kind of kind of tough. Um, two of my friends, uh, Randy Sizemore and Wes Leach, uh, programmed uh, the, uh, the computer to to do this on our router. And they had to, it was, it was a real high wire act because if you think about it, um, this all has to work exactly like this and then, and then back again. And if it doesn't, uh, then uh, the slats will bind. And anyway, uh, I remember at the time uh, they had to come up with just the exact width router bit that would uh, cut this whole path all nice and neatly like this so that everything would go back together again and preserve that geometry that had been designed here at Monticello. And it, was, it wasn't easy. I remember a you know, good friend of mine, Randy. Randy was sort of the lead craftsman on this. Uh, Wes helped out a lot and uh, uh, Mike Kipper is another really talented mill worker did the frames. But Randy Sizemore was putting all of these guys together. And I remember he got this whole thing together and we have a sample here. Why don't we bring that over? Yeah, can I sneak in front of you here? Yeah, sure. There we are. So you want to put it up there? Yeah, let's put it right up. All right. Randy got this all together, you know, and uh, unpainted and it was just perfect. 
And then he went to operate it and it wouldn't move an inch. I mean, just the slats just didn't. And I remember it took him, it took him days. He was really, really thinking about this. What is it that's wrong here? Why won't it operate? And uh, it wasn't uh, until, let's open it up, until he discovered something by looking at uh, sort of a, a blow up of the, uh, of the Lennox shutters. And he, what he found out was, and this is kind of hard, this, uh, yeah, whoops, this piece here, okay, has to be relieved so that it goes back in. And I guess this is pretty hard to show you, but where these two pieces meet, this is called a miter, okay? And this has to be right just so like this. But when the operating rod comes down like I'm so like this, this inner part has to clear the round part of the bead here. So it was Randy who came up with this idea that you had to relieve the inner edge right there from looking at blow-ups of the Lennox blinds and the thinking about it. So, I mean, that was, that was genius. I thought that was some of the slickest pieces of millwork I'd ever seen. You know, the fact that he put it together and, uh, you know, and I think that's always, he's always thought a lot, I think a lot about it. I asked him, I asked him what it was about uh, the Monticello blinds that he liked the most. What was the project? He said, well, of course, you know, it was, uh, it was the challenge and, you know, it was, of course, the, it was the honor. But he said, you know, finally he said, just really finally knowing how it worked, you know. So, I mean, I think uh, Randy, uh, tip my hat, you know, one of the best mill workers ever. So, so can you imagine doing this all with hand tools? <laughs> yeah, just boy. Everything would have to be so precise. Those serpentine operating pieces, absolutely precise. Any variation at all in the slats would bind. Every single hole where they, they mount the slats had to be precisely positioned and drilled out, perfectly square, all with hand tools. It's just amazing when you think about it. Just yeah. amazing. And then so we... We, uh, we got them all done and we shipped them here, <laughs> but trials and tribulations were not over. Yeah, the, uh, the hanging of them turned out to be very, very complicated. Uh, and of course that was the final step. We had all these blinds, we had to put them on the house and make them work. So one of the things we were dealing with, in fact, the issue that we were dealing with was that we had all the original hardware that had been reused on the existing blinds. And the pinnels, which are the pins, the, uh, the mail parts that mount to the architraves or trim of the window, were all in their original positions. But the straps themselves had all been reused and shuffled around to different blinds, so they didn't work anymore. They did, the blinds didn't meet properly when we tried to close them. They flopped to one side or the other when we tried to, to open them all the way up, and it just turned into a real, real difficult situation. So what we ended up doing, uh, our installer, a fellow by the name of Henry Kersley, a very talented mason as well as a blacksmith, was able to customize each one of the hinges uh, using a torch and an anvil up on the scaffolding to slightly bend the straps of the hinges <laughs> so that they would work with the I, panels. I, I, have to, I have to comment here, you know, after, you know, a few years in the construction industry, you hear stories, you know, some of them involve scaffolds and the ones with anvils almost never turn out well for anyone. <laughs> so, but, but he did it. I mean, it was amazing. Yeah, I could just hop up here and show you uh, how these things meet up now and maybe you can get an idea of the complexity of the, uh, sure. the operation of these things. Here, I'll get out of the way here. So these are the pintles, and they were the ones that stayed in their original position. It was the straps, really, that had to be altered, although there were some cases where the pintles themselves, the pins, were tweaked every so, ever so slightly this way and that. So... Uh, let's see if I can get around here. So the idea is that they have to lap in the middle. They don't just butt together. They have to lap over absolutely precisely. And then when they, they open up, they have to clear the blinds below with a little bit of a margin so that they don't bind up when you open them. So seems simple. But in fact, 
it was very difficult, particularly with a tiered system of blinds here versus most windows that just have a single blind on each side. Here we have three tiers of blinds, each one for a separate sash on the triple sash windows. So that was the final step. Took uh, the better part of six months just to, uh, to install these blinds. So oh, a very uh, complicated and in-depth process here. Um, and we have a question, uh, a couple of questions actually. Um, so um, Peter wonders uh, what methods would have been uh, used to make these in Jefferson's time. Uh, and then um, Sherry would like to know uh, whether uh, they were originally built by enslaved people. So can you talk a little bit more about what you've learned from Jefferson's records about the construction of the original blinds? Well, in terms of the, uh, these, these serpentine pieces, you would have used a, uh, a, probably a bow saw to cut those out. And they probably would have been done from a single piece of wood so that they would sort of automatically made. But then you'd have to uh, deal with all of those cut edges. It would have to be either scraped or sanded out uh, so that you wouldn't have the saw cuts on the edges. And they did in fact have sandpaper back then. We have uh, you know records of orders for sandpaper during the, uh, uh, the building of Monticello. In terms of whether or not they were enslaved workers, um, many of these joiners employed or owned slaves and they would have certainly have been involved uh, in the process. But as with the case with so many enslaved workers, uh, they're unkno unnamed, unknowable at this point. But Peter Lennox was a white joiner in Washington, DC. Uh, other than that, we don't really know the names of any of his slaves that might've been involved in, in making these blinds. In, in one sense too, that also gets back to the idea of why we might do this too. I mean, at some point, some year, you know, uh, years from now, somebody might come up uh, and say and point to them and say, you know, my grandfather said that was the only way to make a shutter. And, uh, you know, uh, his grandfather was from Virginia. And maybe, maybe then we'll be able to do some of this linking up that we do in the in the getting word project. To, uh, to you know, recognize all these people who don't necessarily have even names who worked on the house. We do know that John Hemmings was making blinds for Poplar Forest though, because there is a specific reference to him uh, in 1818 uh, making blinds. Jefferson talks about him uh, cutting out the slats with a handsaw individually. So again, that gives you an idea of the process uh, because yeah. That's the very beginning step in yeah. construction is, is, is basically preparing your material. And usually that's, you know, you go to the lumber yard yeah, and it's all done for you. You don't have to worry about that right. sort of thing. You've got a good video on that on our site, I remember. Just uh, what's involved before you can do anything, you've got to take this rough piece of wood and work it up, you know, true it up. It's got to have, a, got to have two flat sides and two parallel edges. And that in itself is a, is a long, long thing. Yep, it sure is. Because a lot of stuff uh, over time, you know, when you're seasoning it, it can twist, uh, it can bow. Everything has to be trued up. And that was all done with hand tools. Yeah. We still face that in millwork today. So another question, um, Bonnie uh, is wondering if during Jefferson's time, they would have closed the shutters and blinds every night. They were more used during the daytime. Uh, as far as the shutters go, um, I can't really say, but they certainly were used for security purposes. Um, but it was mainly a uh, uh, something in terms of the exterior blinds of something that were used during the daytime in terms of keeping the house shady and cooler during the summer months. And many times when you see images of these, these houses during the period, 19th century photographs of places during that time frame, you see them with all the shutters closed, all the blinds closed. And so it, it gives you a, an, an idea of the fact that they were using them back then. Whereas now they're really just decorative. And in fact, in most cases, they're just simply nailed on the side of the house, on either side of the windows, not functional at all. They're just decorative. But that certainly wasn't the case in the, uh, the 19th and early 20th century. But shutters are absolutely cool, aren't they? I mean, if you think about it, you know, even, you know, something like this. This is, you know, the last of a, the last of a type of wooden machine that we all used to live with in an era when 
machines were wood and ships were wood and <coughs> carriages were wood and so much was wood. We, it really was America's wooden age. We have a question um, from Andy who would like to know um, what changed about the house while the levees owned it uh, and then how did we go about restoring it to the way that it was during Jefferson's time? So the Levy family bought uh, Monticello in 1835 and there were two generations of Levy family. There was Uriah P. Levy that owned Monticello from 1835 until the Civil War period and then Jefferson Monroe Levy that owned Monticello from 1880 until 1923. We don't really have a record of anything that was done during the early period, the pre-Civil War period, but certainly uh, Jefferson Monroe Levy was, was responsible for really uh, preserving Monticello uh, because we have photographs from the 1870s showing Monticello looking in very dilapidated condition. Uh, it really went downhill during the Civil War period. And one thing that we do know that was done uh, by the, the Levy family was to restore the blinds, in fact, because we do have photographs from the 1870s showing the blinds in place uh, just prior to the, uh, the acquisition, reacquisition, I should say, of Monticello in 1880 by Jefferson Monroe Levy. Uh, and in that photograph that we have, those photographs, these original blinds are really in basically falling apart condition, many of them. So they were restored, and interestingly enough, uh, very accurately so. They weren't restored as movable slat blinds, but the exact uh, construction methods were used in terms of the, the, uh, the dimensions of the rails and styles, the frame of the sash, the depth of the slats. So obviously they were using these original blinds as a prototype for their restoration in the late 19th century. So uh, we've also had a couple of questions uh, about whether or not here at the foundation we work with historic preservation majors and, and other sorts of students to make sure that all of this wonderful knowledge that y'all have uh, is being passed on to the next generation of uh, people who will do architectural restoration. Well, every summer we would have interns that would come in and work for the summer and we always have ongoing projects that we can keep, busy, keep, keep bus people busy, either doing research or actually doing hands-on work. So uh, that really has been an ongoing sort of responsibility really of Monticello uh, in terms of trying to, uh, to school people that are just coming, coming up uh, in the field uh, to correct practices in preservation and give them some experience uh, at a place like Monticello, which is uh, uh, really uh, foremost uh, in the country in terms of uh, a site. Absolutely. All right, well, we have time for one more question uh, and that's gonna be sort of wrapping things up for us. Looking at this long project, um, what are the key takeaways, the important lessons that y'all uh, take from this? Oh, I would have to say this, this dogged pursuit of, you know, what is it really, <laughs> you know, wherever it's going, wherever it's going to lead you uh, is, is my takeaway. It's a kind of a discipline here, uh, a way to live you know, asking the question, you know, is it too easy? If the answer is too easy, it probably is. <laughs> and the other thing about here is that uh, just about the time you think uh, you've got all the answers, uh, you're probably in for a surprise. <laughs> and uh, I think that's a, a perhaps a good way to pursue a whole lot more than just shutters. Well, I have to come back again to uh, just the respect for the people that were doing this work originally, as well as the folks that can pull it off uh, in modern times. And also uh, to close, I'd like to say that, you know, it really is an ongoing process here at Monticello. There are always things going on right up until the present. Um, and in answer to the previous question that I didn't address, there have been many, many things uh, accomplished in just the last couple of years uh, here at Monticello, especially on the interior of the house, reinterpretation of all these various spaces based on uh, Jefferson letters and, and uh, family references, those sorts of things. So if you've been to Monticello before uh, and think you've seen it all, uh, come back because there's always, always something new to see here. Absolutely. Well, thank you, Bob and Charles, for being with us today. 
Um, thank you to all of our viewers for uh, joining us for this Monticello live stream. Uh, and we hope that you'll join us again next week uh, for a conversation with Benjamin Franklin.